Fear is a feeling that is experienced when you foresee a bad future. And here's the reality with fear. All of us have felt it. Now with our fears, some of us deny our fears. Others of us are driven by our fears. But we've all felt fear. And the thing with our fears is our feelings of fear can be fickle, right? One moment we could feel bold, ready to face anything, ready to face the world. And the next moment we could be shaking in our boots, not sure about the future, not sure how we're going to handle what is at hand. And here's the thing. God doesn't want you to be overcome by your fears. In fact, God wants you to overcome your fears. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about overcoming the spirit of fear. Overcoming the spirit of fear. And we're going to be doing that today as we look at the Apostle Paul's writings to his mentee, Timothy. Now, Paul and Timothy, they had had a long-standing relationship. In fact, in Timothy's teenage years, Paul had began a relationship with him and began to build him up not only as a believer, but as a minister of the gospel, as a leader in the church. And there are actually two letters in the New Testament, First and Second Timothy, that Paul wrote to Timothy individually to not only give him practical wisdom and guidance on how to lead a church, but also personal and spiritual and, emo- and uh, support so that he could actually face and overcome his fears. You see, Timothy was a was a bold man. He was a good soldier for the kingdom of God. He was a bold leader, but just like any other human, he had fears that he had to face. And so Paul would write to Timothy and help him overcome his fears. And so as we look at these writings from Paul to Timothy, I want to share with you today four steps that you can take that if you take these four steps, I really do believe that it will allow you to be able to overcome the fears in your life. Some of you, you feel like your life is driven by fear or overrun by fear. From God's Word today, you will have four practical tools that will help you to not be overcome by it, but to actually overcome the fears. But before we get to those four steps today on how to overcome fear, we first need to start with three causes of fear. In other words, three ways that fear can mess up your life. And then we're going to look at three different problems that all of us can face at varying times in our lives that can easily cause fear in our lives. So first, three causes of fear. Let me just read to you 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. This is really the theme verse of our message today. It's really the center point of it all. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and he says, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us fearful, but gives us power, love, and a sound mind. I want you to know that through the Spirit of God, you can have a power and you can have a love and you can have a sound mind to who you are that can get you through anything. Now, what's the opposite of that? Well, if you're not fearless through the Spirit of God, but you're fearful because you're not living within the Spirit of God, well, what does that mean? It means that you lack power, you lack love, and you lack a sound mind. And isn't that exactly what... All of us have experienced when we feel driven by or controlled or filled by fear. Firstly, we see that it's easy for us to lose our power. In fact, fear has this ability to freeze you. Like at a night where it's really, really cold, maybe below freezing, and you wake up in the morning and the door is stuck frozen. You can't open it up. It's frozen shut. And you know, that's exactly what fear does to your soul. It paralyzes you. It stops you in your tracks. It saps you of all your strength so that you're not able to face the struggles that this life here on earth causes us to encounter regularly. And really what fear does is it causes us to lose power to the point where it gets harder to get out of bed sometimes. In fact, if you are completely driven by fear, it can keep you in bed. It can keep you from facing the struggles and the challenges of life and and facing the struggles of life. And so what you begin to do is you, because you don't have the power, you avoid it or you deny it. So fear causes you to lose power. But we know that fear doesn't just cause us to lose our power. It also causes us to lose our love, doesn't it? Did you know that it's impossible 
to love God and love others while you're filled with fear? Do you know that? Think about it like this. Say you have a fear of, uh, let's say snakes. Okay, my wife is deathly afraid of snakes. Like if you want to freak Jamie out, just bring a snake by her. She will not trust you. She will not want to be around you. She will literally sprint out the door. I'm not even kidding. So imagine that you have that fear. You're fearful of snakes. I take you into a room filled with snakes. And while we're in that room, I say, hey, uh, I'm going to share with you my deepest, darkest struggles, and I want to ask that you would pray for me right now. Guess what? You're not going to do that. You're not going to be able to listen to my story, and you're not going to be able to pray for me. You're going to be so filled with fear, you're going to want to leave that room. You're not going to be focused on me. You're going to be focused on your fears if that's your fear, and that's what you're driven by in that moment. And you see, it's impossible to be focused on others when you're filled with fear. It's impossible to love somebody sacrificially with your time, with your money, with your energy, with your effort, if you're filled with fear. And here's what fear does, is it makes you selfish. What fear does is fear makes you inward focused when you should be outward focused. So fear causes you to lose your power, it causes you to lose your love, but it also causes you to lose your mind. And some of you can relate to this. Fear causes you to absolutely lose your mind. Why? Because fear is not logical. Oftentimes it's illogical. Oftentimes our fears are not even grounded in reality. Now, sometimes our fears can be grounded, and this is how it can become deceptive. 10% reality, 90% non-reality. It's like, okay, yeah, that little part right there, that might be true, that might happen. But literally 90% of what you're afraid about, a lot of the times when fear begins to really run rampant in our life, we begin to not think truthfully, but we begin to think fearfully. And so it's like around every corner is the worst thing that could possibly happen. My future is filled with the worst thing that, it, that could possibly happen. And you begin to think in the worst case scenarios, which is the exact opposite of faith. So fear causes you to lose your power, your love, and if you let it, it can cause you to absolutely lose your mind. Now, what we can see here is that there are actually, there are problems in our life that can sometimes trigger us to be fearful. Now, I want to just preface this before I get into some of those problems. These problems that I'm about to list, they don't have to cause fear in your life. In fact, that's the whole point of the message today and the four points of overcoming fear is that you can actually overcome problems and obstacles in your life and not be filled with fear when you face the problems, but actually be filled with faith when you face the problems. But here are three problems that can often and easily cause us to be fearful. And I'm going to share these problems that are actually problems from Timothy's life. You see, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, which I just read to you, Paul writes to Timothy and he encourages him to not be filled with fear, but to be filled with the Spirit of God so that he could have power and love and a sound mind. Now the question is, is why would Paul write that to Timothy? Why would he feel compelled to encourage Timothy to not be a fearful person, but to be led by the Spirit of God? Well, the only plausible explanation for that is because Timothy must have wrestled with fear to some degree. Timothy must have been facing some circumstances in his life that could have easily led him to be filled with fear. So then the question is, well, what were those problems that Timothy was facing? Well, remember I read to you in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the Spirit of God does not make you fearful. Well, if you go back to 1 Timothy, you'll get a little bit more context, a little bit more understanding in his life what were some of the problems were, that he was facing that might have been causing him to be filled with fear? Well, I think they're actually very similar to a lot of the problems that we face in our life. So here's the first problem we see is this, is chronic illness. Chronic illness. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, it says this. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, and he encourages him. He says, stop drinking only water and use a little wine. You're like, oh, sounds good. I'm going to go home and drink some wine tonight. It's in the Bible. Praise the Lord. Right? Don't get drunk on wine. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. But there's nothing wrong with a little wine. Right? Just a little wine in moderation. But he says, stop drinking only water. Use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. So the idea here is, Timothy, we're not exactly sure what he had. There wasn't a diagnosis. But there was something wrong with his stomach. And he actually, as Paul says, was frequently ill. 
Okay, now, I got to be honest with you. Some of you know this already, but like three years ago, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, which is a stomach condition. And for the last three years, I've had weeks where like I feel great, and then other weeks where I'm like, eh, and then other weeks where I'm like, oh my gosh, I literally feel like I just, I can't fully function like I want to. Like I feel so sick. And a few weeks ago was probably one of the most sick times like I've ever had. It was probably the most sick I've ever been. Uh, That or one other time. And honestly, during that time, uh, I was struggling with a lot of fear. Fear of like, am I always going to be sick? Uh, Is God ever going to heal me? Uh, Am I ever going to get medicine that's going to make me better? Is this just just like an issue I'm going to just have to deal with my whole life, like a roller coaster of like, you know, one week I'm going to be good, another week I'm not going to be good. And just honestly feeling really discouraged, really fearful, like am I going to get colon cancer because that's like a higher risk for what I have. And I was just, I was feeling, and honestly, I was filled with a lot of fear. And I was reading a book, and this verse popped up, and it was like God hugged me in that moment. Because it was like God was like, hey, I want you to know that there was this guy named Timothy, and he was the leader of this church, and he struggled with these frequent illnesses, but I still loved him, and I was still with him, and I still used him, and I still allowed him to persevere through it and be used by me for other people's good and my glory, and if I could do it with him, I could do it for you. And I was like, oh. But I want you to know this. Maybe you don't have a chronic illness. Maybe there's just been a health issue you've had, like an episode or a time in your life where you weren't healthy. Here's the reality. We all live on earth. We have human bodies. There's going to be times where we're all sick. There's going to be a point where we all have some kind of serious illness in our life. And let's just be honest about it. That could be scary. Illness, sicknesses, diseases. It can, I mean, remember the pandemic just a few years ago? All the fear that people were, were, were filled with, and I'm not trying to get political about it, about, you know, why people did this and that, but I mean, let's just look at the reality. People were scared for their lives, and it made people do some really crazy things. And so what can happen is that when we have illnesses and sicknesses in our life, it has this ability to fear, fill us with fear. But here's the amazing thing. It, it doesn't have to. So the first problem we see is chronic illnesses or any kind of illness, but then also relational rejection. Relational rejection can be a problem that can easily cause us to have fear. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and impurity. Now, Timothy was a leader of the church in Ephesus. I'm going to talk more about the church in Ephesus in just a moment. But Timothy was a very young leader. In fact, like I said earlier, Paul likely found Timothy in his teenage years, and he was a church leader in his late teenage years, and in his 20s, he was leading churches. And so Paul is obviously writing to Timothy here and telling him to not let anybody look down on him. Why would he write that? Because I think obviously people were looking down on him. People were discounting him, not because of his competency and not because of his character, but just because of his age. And he was struggling with being rejected by other people as a leader because of how old he was. And, you know, this idea of relational rejection, this prospect of that, it can be something that could so easily fill us with fear. Maybe it's you fear the rejection of your spouse if they really knew who you were, or you fear the rejection of your boss or a co-worker or a friend or some other family member or some other peer in your life. You see, when we have this fear of relational rejection in our life, what it can do is it can keep us from revealing the real us and it can keep us from stepping out in faith and doing what God has called us to do. So the fear of relational rejection can easily cause us to be filled with fear, but like I said, it doesn't have to. But then the third problem we see that can easily fill us with fear is this, is great responsibility. Great responsibility. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 says this. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Now, Paul sent Timothy... They had traveled and done all sorts of work all over the world to sharing the gospel. But Paul sent Timothy on a special mission to Ephesus 
to lead that church and to set that church in order and to correct certain false teachings. Now, Ephesus was probably one of the largest, if not the largest church in the early church. It was thousands of people. In fact, when you study Paul's missionary journeys, Ephesus was where he stayed the longest. He stayed there for over three years. Thousands of people came to faith. We're told that literally people from all over the region came and became Christians. And Paul's like, yeah, Timothy, I know you're my youngest person that I'm mentoring, but I'm going to send you to the biggest church in the whole early church. And you're going to lead it and you're going to set it in order. That's an enormous responsibility. And here's the thing. When you have an enormous responsibility in your life, maybe it's the responsibility of being a father, the responsibility of being a mother, the responsibility of managing your finances, the responsibility at your job, whatever responsibility you have, here's the thing. With great responsibility can often come great fear. But again, God does not want your responsibilities to overwhelm you and to burden you to the point of fear. He wants to use those responsibilities to sharp your character, refine your character, so that you're not filled with fear, but with faith. So the question is, is with all these problems that we face in our life, how do you make sure that the problems of illnesses and responsibilities and relational rejections and all the other problems that we could face in life, how do you make sure that those problems do not fill you with fear, but actually sharpen your faith? Well, let's get into those four points today. First, if you want to overcome fear, the first thing you have to do is this. Is you got to overcome fear with your spiritual family. Let me say that again. Overcome fear with your spiritual family. Now we're going to go back into 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. Paul, and this is the opening of this second letter. And let me just by way of introduction, even before reading it, say this. 2 Timothy is probably Paul's last letter, or one of his last letters. He's writing it from prison, and he knows he's about to be executed. He knows his head's about to literally get chopped off for being a person that shared the gospel with people and started churches. So this is his last words to one of his closest friends. Is He's in a dark prison. Prior, Paul had been on house arrest, but now in this prison, he's literally in a pit in the ground with really, it's basically solitary confinement. And he knows he's about to be killed, and he's writing to one of his closest friends, and he says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So, Paul is in prison. He's about to die, but he's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about his son in the faith, Timothy, and how he can write to him to encourage him in his faith, to build him up, to give him practical tools on how to lead the church, and to help him overcome his fears. Now, this is so important because I want you to notice that Paul is talking about the sincerity of Timothy's faith in verse 5. And I read to you earlier, verse 7, as he encourages him not to be in fear. And here's the implication I want to pull out here just really quickly. Is that Timothy was as sincere as a Christian as you could possibly be, yet he still struggled with fear. He still faced fears. And I want you to know that some people think, oh, when I become a Christian, like life's just going to become easy. I'm not going to have any temptations or any struggles. Listen, it is possible to be tempted with fear as a Christian. And it's even impossible. It's not the ideal, but to be a Christian and to be filled with fear. And so Paul writes to Timothy so that he's not filled with fear. And he writes to him to give him relational and spiritual support. Did you realize in these verses I just read to you how relational those verses are? He calls Timothy, you're my dear son. I long to see you again. Oh, I remember the last time 
that we left. You cried tears as you left me and I left you. There's a relationship here. They lived together. They did life with one another. Even now that they're apart, he's writing to him. He's supporting him. It's a deep relationship. But not just relational support, spiritual support. He says, day after day, Timothy, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you would overcome. I'm praying that God would give you wisdom. I'm praying that God would give you strength. I'm praying for you. My question is, is do you have spiritual family that can help you overcome your fears? I hope you know that here at Arroyo Church, this is a spiritual family with whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're falling short with, whatever you're fearful about, anxious about, depressed about. This is a place where you can be the real you. Listen, there's an ideal you. I don't need to see your ideal you. Okay, we can strive for the ideal you. The ideal you can be your goal. Hey, let's pursue the ideal you together, which is the ideal you, a person that's in Christ and fully following him. But don't show me the ideal you. Show me the real you. That's what real Christian community is about, is be real, be authentic, be genuine. Because that is when you can have support relationally and spiritually. Somebody can't pray for you and help you if they don't know what you're scared of. They don't know what you're anxious about. They don't know what your struggles are. And here at Arroyo, this is a community, this is a place where you can do that. You know, you can think about it like this. Redwood trees, if you look at them, they're big and they're strong and they're powerful and they're strong and you know, they're sturdy. But did you know their roots actually don't go that deep? They only go about 10 to 12 feet deep. But they go about 60 to 80 feet wide. And the reason why they go wide is because they actually interlock roots with other redwood trees. You see, they don't get strength by themselves by going deep. They go strength, get strength through one another by going wide and actually interlocking with one another. And you see, it's the same with you and I. We need spiritual, relational support from our spiritual family so that we can overcome fears. Here's what Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says. It says, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, do you have somebody to carry your burdens? The burden of your fear, the burden of your guilt or anxiety or depression. Listen, if you are carrying like you try to carry this really big couch, and you realize you can't carry it yourself, and then you get somebody to help you, well, now you've just cut the weight in half, and now you can carry it, and you can go forward. But what if now, instead of just one person helping you, you get a person on every corner, now it's four people carrying it? Well, the weight that you could not carry yourself when you add one other person becomes doable, and you're able to go forward. When you add three other people, it's like, oh, this is nothing. This is easy. And I want you to know this. The more people that you get involved in your life, that genuinely care about you and are following Jesus and want to give you relational and spiritual support, the weight that was crushing you can become light. And I've experienced this so much in my life where literally there was a weight that was crushing me and it went from feeling so heavy and crushing me to the point where it was light and it was easy. And what happened was, is the weight didn't change, but the support changed. The weight didn't change, but the people that were carrying it with me changed. And you know, when I was sick just a few weeks ago, and honestly, the first week I was sick, I really wasn't telling that many people about it. And I was just kind of keeping it to myself and toughing it out. I'll be fine. I'm fine. And you know what? The second week, it started to weigh on me a little bit more. of just carrying it by myself. And I started to get a little depressed. And I started to be filled with fear. And so, you know, I started sharing it with some more people. And you know what? I started to feel the weight lessen a little bit. But you know what? I started getting even more sick after the second week. And I, you know what I did? I, I, I normally don't do this type of stuff, but I posted online. I just, I said, hey, be praying for me. You know, I'm not doing well. Literally had like probably over 60 or 70 people send me personal messages. Hey, I'm praying for you. Or hey, you know, I also struggle with that or whatever. And by that point, I hadn't even started to get better yet. I'm obviously like, if you can't tell, I'm doing really well right now. But before I even started feeling better, I got so much support. Even though my symptoms were getting worse, my spirit was so light, it was just, oh, I'm not even afraid anymore. Like Even if it gets worse or even if I die or whatever, I'm going to be okay. Because I know that I'm not alone. So question, do you have that? Do you have the ability to share your weaknesses, to share your fears, share your anxieties? Because as you do that and people come alongside you, the weight will begin to be lighter. 
Now, here's the second way and second step that you can begin to overcome fear. So first, it's with spiritual family, but then the second way you overcome fear is by fanning into the flame. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's look at it. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, and also I will reread verse 7. For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us fearful, but gives us power, love, and a sound mind. Now, Timothy was gifted by God in a unique way so that he could serve God for the good of others and for the glory of God. And we're told here that the gift that he had was actually received by Paul laying his hands on him and imparting that gift to him. Did you know that you could do that? I believe that if you have a spiritual gift as an older spiritual mentor, you can lay your hands on a younger person and you can ask God that God would gift them. God, would you bless this person? Would you fill them with the spiritual gift? Would you impart the gift that you've given me? Can you give that to them? The strength that you've given me, can you give that to them? And so Paul had imparted this gift to Timothy and prayed and asked God to give it. And God, in his grace, gave that gift to Timothy, that gift, that mantle of leadership. And Paul says, listen, Timothy, I don't want you to squelch this gift. I don't want this flame to die out. But instead, I want you to fan into the flame the gift of God that is within you. And I want you to know this. This is what fear does to the gift God has given you. Fear is like a fire extinguisher on the gift that is the fire of God on your life. See, God's gift, it's like this fire, this fire that can bring warmth and life to your life and the life of those around you and bring other people to Christ. And what fear does is fear is like this fire extinguisher that just takes it out. See, when you are filled with fear, God cannot use you. God cannot use people that are completely dominated by fear. But he can use people that are driven by faith. That are willing to trust him and step out and do things for him, even when it might mean they might fail or might endure suffering. And so what does Paul says? He says, hey, I don't want you to let this flame die out. I don't want you to allow fear to keep you from exercising your gift. And what I want you to do then is to avoid that, I need you to fan into the flame. I don't know about you, but when I'm at a campfire, I'm one of those like pyromaniac people. I, I, I'm like ever since I was a younger person, my brother's the same way. He might even be worse than me. Okay, but we're like, it's like, I'm like this pyromaniac, man. I just, I love the fires. It's so much fun. I, I'm always like add an extra wood to the fire. And you know, when it's just so fun when you're building the fire and like the flame isn't even that big yet. And then you get to blow in the fire. And some of that extra oxygen can help the fire to actually burn uh, faster and help the fire to grow. And that's kind of the idea of what Paul is getting at here is I don't want you to let the, the flame to die out. I want you to, to breathe in it, to fan into the flame. Don't let fear kill it. I want you to fan it. So how do you do that? How do you fan into the flame of the gifts that God has given you? Well, let me just quickly, really quickly, give you three quick ways you can do that. Number one, first, you've got to discover your gift. You can't fan into the flame if you don't even know where the flame is. So first, you've got to discover the gifts. And so you ask the question, okay, what is my shape, right? What, what, what are the spiritual gifts that God has given me? What's on my heart? What are my abilities? What's my personality? What are my experiences? And based off of that, my shape... What are the gifts that God has given me so that I can do good for others and bring glory to Him? And the best way to discover this, by the way, is one, ask people that know you and are willing to be honest with you. Because your gifts and what you're passionate about aren't always the same thing. Sometimes you're passionate about something you're not good at. Sometimes you're passionate about something you're good at. So honestly, ask people, okay, what am I good at? What could you see me doing? And in fact, that Connect class I was talking about earlier in the announcements, a part of our Connect class, which is going to happen on April 7th, is helping you discover your spiritual gifts and how God can use you in those gifts in the church and in your life. So first, you got to discover your gift. But then secondly, another way to fan into the flame so that fear doesn't keep your gift in the ground, buried under the ground, is first you discover the gift. Secondly, you got to actually use your gifts. Your gifts are like a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. 
You can go to the gym for six months and work out, and it'll be great, and you can gain some muscle and get in better shape. But guess what? If you start eating like junk again and you stop going to the gym, you're going to be back to where you were six months later. In fact, it can take six months to get into shape, and you can lose it in a month, right? It's harder to get into shape, isn't it, than it is to, like, to actually stay. Like, it's easier to, to lose it than it is to gain it. And it's the same spiritually with your gifts. In order to fan into the flame, you have to continually use the gifts. But then don't just discover it, don't just use it, but also get coaching about it. Ask people, as you're using your gifts, hey, what could I be doing better? What could be improved? What should I start doing? What should I stop doing? As you fan into the flame, this is what you'll see. God will use you more in other people's lives, and you will be less dominated by fear in your life. Because here's what will happen, okay? If you live in fear and you stay on the sidelines, it will just continue to dominate your life. But if you actually get into the game and you start using your gifts, as you get into the game, it might be scary at first, but as you get into it and as you start like actually being involved and serving and using the gifts God has given you, it will actually help you overcome your fears because here's what happens when you're using your gifts. You're actively focused on God and others rather than yourself. And it gets your eyes off of your anxieties and your eyes on serving the Lord. So that's how you, one of the ways you overcome fear is by fanning into the flame. But now thirdly, you can also overcome fear through the power of the Holy Spirit. Overcome fear through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me read to you verse 7 once more. It says, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us fearful, but gives us power, love, and and a sound mind. I want you to know this. The moment you place your faith in Jesus, not only are you forgiven of all your sins, but you are filled with the Holy Spirit, which means the very nature, the very personhood of God is not just around you, but He is within you. And what we are told here and are proclaimed about is that He says that the Holy Spirit does not make you fearful. In other words, if you are fearful, I want you to know that fear is not from God. That is from the devil, or it is from yourself, or it is from the world, but it is not from God. If you are filled with fear, I just, I, I think I need to say this again to set somebody free today. Your fear is not from God. Your fear about your future, your fear about your finances, your fear about your spouse, your fear about whatever it is. I don't know what your fear is, but I want you to know, whatever you are fearful about, it is not from God. The Spirit God gave you does not make you fearful. It makes you powerful. It makes you loving. And it gives you a sound mind. Now the question is, is how does the Holy Spirit do that? Well, as far as I can tell, He does it in a lot of ways. But let me just share with you two ways the Holy Spirit does that. Number one, by always being with you. And number two, by reminding you of who you are. So first, by always being with you. Let me read to you Psalms chapter 46, verse 1 to 3. This is one of the most beautiful, most comforting verses in all of Scripture. And I'm not saying that by, I'm not exaggerating. Psalm 46, 1 to 3. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not say it. In fact, I just want you to say that right now. Say, we will not. Say, we will not fear. Why? Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. He's saying, when I'm fearful or when there's things going on in my life or when there's problems or when literally the earth seems like it's just shattering and everything is just around me is going terrible, in the midst of that storm, God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. How is he an ever-present help? Well, through his Holy Spirit. And if you're a Christian, his Spirit is within you, which means even when everything around you is going crazy, God is within you, and he is willing to help you and strengthen you and be your refuge. Now, what is a refuge? Well, a refuge is a place you run to. It's a safe place you run to in times of trouble like a shelter. In fact, the White House, it has like this safe bunker. I don't know if you knew this. Under the White House, it's like hundreds and hundreds of feet below. the. Uh, there's like this bunker that they can go during like a nuclear blast or just all sorts of crazy things can happen. And under there, they're fine. 
Nothing, nothing's going to happen. They got all the food they need. They got all the protection they need. They're good. And what God is saying is, is he's saying, when everything around you is going crazy and like everyone around you is going crazy and it just seems like life's falling apart, he's like, I'm your refuge. I'm the place you go to to be safe. Now, does that mean that life is always going to be easy and like there's never going to be any suffering? No, that's not what it means. But here's what it means. It means that you have a safe person to run to that will help you and strengthen you and be with you no matter what. So my question to you is this, is where do you run to for refuge in trouble? Because here's the thing. We all have a refuge we run to. It's just not always God. Sometimes it's alcohol. Sometimes it's drugs. Sometimes it's pornography. Sometimes it's social media addiction. We have all these refuges that we run to and we think it's going to keep us safe in times of our trouble. But what God says is he says, I'm your refuge you can run to in times of trouble. He's your ever-present help in times of trouble, which means never will he leave you, never will he forsake you. He's always there. Even when you don't feel like he's there, I want you to know he's there. And he wants to strengthen you and help you in your times of trouble so that you're not filled with fear. You don't have to fear. So we don't have to fear because through the Holy Spirit, God is always with you. But also through the Holy Spirit, we are constantly reminded of who we are so that we don't have to fear. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14 to 16. It says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in what? Fear, again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Listen, God does not want you to live in fear when it comes to your standing with Him, if you're a Christian. If you've placed your faith in Jesus and you've asked Him to save you, the Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you've called on His name to be saved, you are a child of God, period. And so if that's your reality, and if it's not, by the way, it can become your reality today. You could place your faith in Him. But if that is your reality, you are a child of God, He does not want you to live in fear and constantly be like, oh, does God really love me today because I had a really bad day or I sinned or I messed up? I'm going through some kind of suffering. Like, am I really God's child? Does God really care? Is He, is he near or is he, or is, he, is he distant? And what we're told in this passage is God doesn't want you to live in fear when it comes to your standing with Him. That actually what will happen is in order to give you assurance that His Spirit will speak to your spirit and remind you that you are His child. And those that are children of God have the Spirit of God. Did you know that it's impossible to be a Christian and not be filled with the Spirit of God? If you're not filled with the Spirit of God, it means you're not a child of God. And if you're a child of God, it means you do have the Spirit of God. And the most comforting thing that you could ever experience in your spiritual journey is that comforting whisper, that gentle voice. When you're in the middle of the dark night of the soul and you feel fearful and you're wondering if there's a God that's even real or a God that even cares or a God that could ever forgive or a God that could ever love, and you hear that gentle whisper speak to your soul and say, I love you, you're my son. You're my daughter. You've been bought with a price, and it is finished. And I'm never going to leave you, and I'm never going to forsake you. That's the most comforting voice you could ever hear. That's the voice that takes away all fear, and that's the voice of God. And, you know, uh, with my daughters, I tell them every day that I love them. And I tell them that they're my daughters every day. Like, I can't even count how many times I do it because I, I just do it all the time. And I remind them of who they are, and I remind them of how I feel about them and how much I care about them because I want them to be secure in who they are. I don't want them to ever doubt for a moment that I love them. I want them to be confident in my love for them. And that's exactly what God does for us as his children. It's through his spirit and through his word. He reminds us of who we are in him and our identity in him so that we do not live in fear, but we live confidently as his children. So through the Spirit of God, you can be reminded of who you are, and through the Spirit of God, you can have an ever-present help in times of trouble so that you can overcome fear rather than being overcome by it. Now, here's the fourth and final step you could take in order to overcome fear. It's this, is if you want to overcome fear, you overcome fear with grace and hope. You overcome fear 
with both grace and hope. What do I mean by that? Well, let's read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 to 10. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immorality, immortality to light through the gospel. So Paul, did you catch this in verse 7? which I've read to you like three or four times already by now. He's telling them to not fear because the spirit that God gave us doesn't make us fearful, right? It gives us power, love, and a sound mind. And then it's as if he goes from, hey, I, I need you to overcome your fears. Now he goes to verse eight. Okay, now that you've overcome your fears through the spirit of God, now join me in suffering for the gospel. It's like, whoa, that's a big jump. <laughs> so don't be fearful. The spirit of God can help you overcome your fears. Okay, now you've overcome your fears already. Join me in suffering. Remember, Paul is literally about to have his head chopped off. He is in solitary confinement. He's writing this letter to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I want you to join me in suffering for the gospel. How could he say that? What could motivate that? What could strengthen him to be able to suffer for the gospel in the midst of this broken world? Grace and hope. He begins to remind Timothy of the gospel of grace. He says, Timothy, God saved you. God called you to live a holy life. God called you to be a minister of the gospel, not because of anything you did. It wasn't because you were great. It wasn't because you were intelligent. It wasn't because you were articulate. It was because of what he had done. And in his grace, and what is God's grace? It's his free gift of love and forgiveness in our life. Grace is the fact that God not only saves us because he just chooses to, it's because it's his plan, it's because of his purpose, not only does he save us, but he also sanctifies us and uses us and does incredible things in our life, not because we've earned it or deserved it, but because he wants to give it to us as a gift. And he says, Timothy, this God of grace has, has saved you. And he saved you so that you could have the hope of immortality. You could have the hope that death has been defeated. So Timothy, because of God's grace, you have the hope of heaven. Death has been defeated. And since death has been defeated, I want you to suffer. I want you to suffer for the gospel. I want you to put your life on the line for God's glory and the good of others. What could give somebody the boldness and the courage to do that? To say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand in the line. I'm going to sacrifice my life for the gospel I'm going to step out in faith, even if it means i got to make sacrifices. Even if it means I lose my life, I'm going to do it. How could somebody have that boldness, the hope of heaven, that comes from the grace of God? It's grace and hope. And you know, it's St. Patrick's Day, and I thought it was fitting to maybe talk a little bit about him, because he's actually a great example of this reality. You know, St. Patrick, a lot of people don't know this, but he was actually captured as a slave. He was enslaved. For a very long time. And in fact, it was during his enslavement that he actually had a conversion. He came to Christ. He placed his faith in Jesus. He realized the grace of Jesus in his life. It transformed his life. And then later on, he was actually able to escape the slavery. He ran away. And it was after years of being free that he felt God call him to go back to the very area, the very town where he was enslaved. And to go back there as a missionary to lead people to Christ and to start churches. And so he did that. And his entire ministry, he was, there were many times where he was thrown in prison, where he was beaten up. He faced constant death threats. Um, there were multiple attempts on his life. And even at one point, he was actually put back into slavery temporarily. And there's this quote. I want to read it to you. It comes direct from him. I literally found this at like 1 a.m. in the morning yesterday, or well, I guess today, this morning. And uh, this is such a powerful quote. He says, As every day arrives, I expect either sudden death or deception, or being taken back as a slave, or some other misfortune. But, what does he say? I fear none of these, 
since I looked to the promise of heaven and have flung myself into the hands of an all-powerful God who rules as Lord everywhere. Do you have that kind of boldness? Or are you filled with fear? In fact, in closing, let me just ask you this question today. What fears are you filled with? What fears are plaguing your soul? I want you to know right now, through the Spirit of God and through the Word of God and through the grace of God and through the hope that is found in God, you can be set free from your fears. You do not have to be filled with fear. You can be set free from fear. Did you know that the Bible says the words, do not fear 365 times? Once for every single day. Why? Because God knows that our human hearts are so prone to wander and so prone to be filled with fear. But God says every single day, do not fear for I am with you. I have plans for you. I have a purpose for you. My spirit is with you. The spirit that I have given you will not make you a person that lacks love, but is filled with love. That does not lose your mind, but has a sound mind. It's not drained of power, but is filled with power. How do you overcome fear? Come to Christ by faith. Trust Him to give you the power that you could never have yourself. Trust Him to forgive you. Trust Him to fill you with His Spirit. Trust Him to give you the hope of heaven so that you could even look at the fear of death right in the face and say, Death, you've lost your sting. Because what happened on Easter, which is what we're going to be celebrating about in a few weeks, and you better invite people to come here on Easter because we're going to celebrate big. Because of what He did on that Easter Sunday, that Resurrection Sunday, Man, he defeated death, I can defeat it too. In fact, I will defeat it, it's promised, because he's done it for me. So that I will not fear anything at any time. Because he is with me, he is for me, and he has done all that I need, so that I do not have to fear. Let's pray. And right now, I'm just going to pray a prayer of faith. A prayer of faith to ask that God would just cleanse me of all fears. And if you're here today and maybe there's a fear in your life that's been plaguing you, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer. Maybe there's a a fear that you've been holding on to for a really long time. Maybe you even, as you pray this prayer, maybe you even need to just put your palms up to to the sky. Just open up your hands and surrender to God. Say, God, I give this fear to you. You could pray something like this. Jesus, right now, I come to you by faith. And I'm asking you, through your Holy Spirit, to set me free from fear. So that I would not neglect the gifts that you've given me, but so that I would fan into the flame the gifts that you've given me. Lord, forgive me for the times where I've lacked faith in you and as a result have lived in fear. Lord, today... Help me to live in fear no longer. Help me to be reminded of who you are and what you've done and the promised hope in heaven that I have in you so that when death does come, I will not fear, but I will rejoice knowing that I'll get to see your face. It's in Christ's name. Everybody said, amen.